good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome uh, on behalf of the European Health Forum Gastein and AIDS Healthcare Foundation Europe to this online discussion on business as usual, the case for transforming global health governance. My name is Jackie Davis. I'll have the privilege of moderating our discussion. And the COVID-19 health crisis has demonstrated the need to better anticipate the next pandemic and to harmonize preparedness mechanisms across the globe. As negotiations on an international, a new international agreement on pandemic prevention, preparedness and response get underway, our speakers today are going to consider what they hope for from this process. What should any new agreement look like? How should it be shaped and by whom? And crucially, why it will be so important to involve civil society in the process in order to deliver a transparent, inclusive and accountable future for global health governance. We're also going to hear from some young voices in global health and listen to their hopes and demands for a more equitable tomorrow. Housekeeping before we get underway. If you want to ask a question, there are two options. You can use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. And please, the Q&A tab for questions or comments comments to our panel and our speakers, not the chat button, uh, and please be as brief as possible so I can see at a glance who your question or comment is directed at and what it is you want to know. If you want to take the floor and speak, please click on the raised hands button and when I give you the floor I'll ask you to turn your camera and mic on. You can use the chat if you have any technical issues, you need help from our support team, or if you want to talk to each other, you have a link to something you're doing, a report uh, that you want to share with others, or in any other way converse. I'll give you one opportunity to do that after a bit of polling uh, in a moment as well. Finally, before we get underway, if you would like to tweet out about what you are hearing, and we do urge you, let's get that message out. Please use the hashtag EHFG. 2021. So I'm going to start with two fireside chats, as it were, interviews, one-on-one -on -one chats to provide the context for our discussion. Um, but before I introduced our speakers, and there you see them there on your screen, uh, Yodi Alakija, uh, who is uh, the vice chair of the Africa Union's Vaccine Delivery Alliance. She's also a special envoy and co-chair on the ACT Accelerator. Uh, we're going to be having a chat with Yodi, and we're also going to be having a chat with Michael Weinstein who is president of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. But before I turn to them, I wanted to ask all of you a question. I just want to get a sense from you about your feelings about the prospects of a new international agreement. Do you currently feel optimistic about the prospects for such an agreement. Uh, yes, you think it's, uh, you feel optimistic about the outcome of the negotiations and about the content and the difference it will make. No, you question whether we need it or you're not confident about the outcome of those negotiations or at this stage, it's too early to judge, you're unsure. And I see that we are splitting almost equally between those who feel pretty confident uh, those who do not, uh, and those who at this stage are perhaps reserving judgment. Um, so that is very interesting. See, by the end of this, I'm going to be asking our expert speakers how optimistic they feel and whether they share your assessment, but very evenly balanced at the moment. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Very useful. So, and by the way, if you want to explain uh, to each other why you answered as you did, uh, please, by all means, put some comments in the chat and have that conversation. But most importantly, listen to the conversation that I will be having with our distinguished speakers. So, as I say, I'm going to start with these two one on one conversations, uh, first with Yodi, then with Michael, just to provide some context. So, Yodi, let me come to you first. And as I say, Vice Chair of the African Union's Vaccine Delivery Alliance, Co-Chair and Special Envoy on the ACT Accelerator. Um, how would you have answered that question? Uh, and, and let's simplify it a bit for a moment. Do we actually need a new agreement? Is this the right moment? And if it is, how much difference could it make if we get it right? We'll come on later to how do we get it right? But do we need this? 
Yes, we absolutely do. Hello, Jackie, and it's very good to be with all of you. Um, we absolutely do need um, an international pandemic um, accord, treaty, call it what you may. There was a lot of discussion around the language. Um, we do need one, and we need one because this current pandemic has shown us very clearly that the underlying, ex it, it has ex it's shown the fault lines in the world. The low income and low middle income countries have been left behind and continue to be left behind as the Omicron various rages, variant rages around the world and as some parts of the world are getting third and fourth doses other of vaccines some parts of the world have no tests and haven't even I mean zero zero percent of all Africa have, have have been what we would call fully vaccinated today because the definition of fully vaccinated has shifted to three doses so we absolutely do need an accord we need one now and we need to get to it we need to how I would have answered the question was I would have said yes um, I understand why so many people are unsure because there is a deep mistrust in the system there's a deep mistrust in the in the global health infrastructure which again this pandemic has shown us is clearly broken it is fractured it has failed to deliver for the high income countries never mind the low income countries of the world the hundreds and thousands and millions of dead around the world have shown us that we have not learned the lessons from hiv aids we have not learned what we should have what we should have learned about protecting the most vulnerable protecting the voice voiceless protecting the most dispossessed of us amongst the world so yes we need an accord and i would say that we need stronger international rules really to address the, the risk of pandemics because clearly um they are they th 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 this is not the end and, and yoda you talked about that deep mistrust what for you is going to be the key if this agreement is going to deliver and address uh those fault lines that you've just sp spoken about if it is going to do that and build the trust what for you is the key to making it work inclusion um, the absolute key is inclusion, without a doubt. I mean, what what we've seen in this pandemic has been the it's it's been a pandemic of of um, of the rich versus the poor, of the the high income countries versus low income countries. It's been an, a pandemic of inequity and injustice, and um, and all of those things. I mean, if you look even around the world um, at what is happening right now, not just in health, but even in I said right at the very beginning of the pandemic at some some. Um, conference also that I addressed that I really felt that COVID as it is was going to really sh shake the the world structure and I think we're seeing that I think we're seeing it shake governments we're seeing it you know remove leaders because trust both in, in the if it were the UK if I were to go from where your voice comes from and mine comes from if you talk about the trust in systems I mean we're seeing in places like the UK prime minister is about to topple because of trust due to COVID we're seeing trust issues in Africa where, where, where people, you know, because of poverty that came out of the pandemic, people were not receiving, were not receiving social intervention um, packages, Go governments were, were hoarding items. Um, so trust in, in whole society, but so trust within nations and then trust between nations, trust from the high income countries and the low income countries. Africa at one point, of, uh, sometime last year, there was a statement made that Africa wanted, we wanted our own um, global pandemic treaty. I mean, not global, our own pandemic treaty, mm. which uh, to my mind, I argued was a little nonsensical because obviously if it's if a pandemic is, is a pandemic, it's the whole world. But that arose because of a lack of trust and because Absolutely. we felt like we'd been left behind. But Yoda, you talk there about that key being inclusion and you were talking about equity, you were talking about yeah. those gaps, but also inclusion in the sense of, of giving the silent voices a voice making sure that everybody is involved in this process of developing a new agreement the type of agreement you hope will deliver uh, and then in the governance of the future what is the key there how important will that be as part of this trust building and how how do we do it briefly we'll come back to this with our panel a bit later on but what do you see as the key there and how important will that be well, let me use, you introduced me just earlier as being a, um, now being um, Special Envoy, um, WHO Special Envoy, and also co-chair of the Act Accelerator. Let me use that as an example. I did an interview with Development Today earlier, which we talked about that. And the, the analogy I gave was that 
um, when I walked, when I sort of metaphorically, because of course it's mainly virtual, walked into my first um, ACT Accelerator meeting, it felt like my first day at boarding school. I was sent off by my parents to boarding school in England because they were working overseas when I was nine, nine, 10 years old, which is where I got my voice from. And it felt like my first day in boarding school. It was, it was, I felt it, 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 it was really confronting because everybody was different because I was the only person of of a certain hue I was also the only woman so when we talk about inclusion we're not just talking low-income countries we're talking you know we're not just talking siestas we're talking women we're talking those those who have not been at the table because you cannot do something we cannot build a treaty if we're not talking to those and including at the table those who have the lived experience we need those with the lived experience you cannot design for me a system to prevent pandemics in the low-income country of the world without talking to me first there's a phrase there's a saying in my language which is yoruba that you cannot shave my head in my absence and that is what the world has sought to do through covid they've sought to shave our heads in our absence de de decisions and 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 and, and um, various plans have been made around our lives without us being fully present at the table so this is what i mean by inclusion we need to be at that table we need to be in the development of the accord and we also need to be a part of the governance of the accord we need to be we literally need to be at that table otherwise it will not work we'll talk more about how to make sure that happens uh, in a moment thank you yodi will be joining us for the panel again uh, in a few minutes but i wanted to turn now uh, to michael to michael Einstein, uh, president of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. And for you, Michael, you've been calling for changes, uh, for a new way of doing this since 2014, since the Ebola outbreak. For you, um, do you, do you share Yodi's view that this really is needed, is needed now? Um, and, and can it succeed where other uh, initiatives have failed? What, what will be the key for you to making it work? Hey, first of all, my answer to the question uh, that you posed to the audience um, was that I'm not optimistic, uh, which is somewhat uncharacteristic uh, posture for me. I mean, you have to consider that what's happened in the last two years in response to COVID is an epic fail. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we, um, we didn't have uh, transparency in relationship to the origin. We didn't have accountability um, starting at the Geneva level uh, uh, and across the globe um, in terms of the policies. And certainly we see that with the lack of vaccine equity, which is uh, a tragedy, uh, both for the countries that can't get vaccinated, but for the entire world. And, um, one key aspect that's not spoken about enough, in my opinion, is coordination. Um, and, um, and we did not see that anywhere near the degree we needed to. I mean, when I look at um, you know, what an ideal response would have looked like mm. compared to what happened, I mean, I think it's very hard to say that, that it was in any way, shape, or form a good response or that it's necessarily, you know, generates optimism for the, uh, for the future. And by, by the way, I just wanna make a note that we talk about pandemic uh, you know, prevention, but there are many disastrous health crises across the globe that never rise to pandemic levels. So, you know, I, I would have preferred to see um, a global public health convention. I mean, malaria, which is a deadly killer, um, really only affects poor countries and, uh, and such. But, but I think that the, um, the issue really uh, has to be that if we don't elevate global public health and, and uh, disease prevention to the level of things such as air traffic control or bank transfers or world trade, then we're never going to uh, make any significant progress. So undoubtedly a need for this agreement, but you're not optimistic. Why aren't you optimistic? Well, I mean, just today um, it was very interesting because, um, you know, the African delegation, I think, rightly asked for stable funding. Uh, the, uh, you know, the Russians and the Chinese are opposed to civil society being at the table. Um, you know, the, the Germans have taken a hard stand against sharing of intellectual property. 
Um, I mean, the only reason that the World Health Assembly passed this resolution to create a treaty was because we were in the grips of the worst fear of Omicron at that moment in time. Um, but I wanted to comment to, to what we said earlier that um, about inclusion, because you know we, and and also what uh, you had said about the uh, not learning the lessons of HIV. The reason why the HIV response became a huge success in the world was because of civil society and the voice of people living with HIV itself. Um, and also because the fight against um, intellectual property uh, exclusion and for uh, generic drugs uh, was won. So, um, I mean, I think that, you know, again, if you compare it to air traffic control, there is one set of rules for the world. If you wish to land, have pl planes land in your country, okay, then you must abide by those rules. And if you don't wish to have planes land in your country, then you can go, go it alone. And I think anything less than that is not really very serious. Um, but also, I mean, uh, you know, when you're trying to put out a, uh, a brush fire, a huge fire, right? Um, you don't ask how much it costs. I mean, when you consider the trillions of dollars of wealth that have been erased in the last uh, two years, compared to the paltry budgets for global health, it makes no sense. But I don't yeah. see like an awakening of, of world leadership to that realization. Yeah. But as you say, that key role that civil society played in terms of HIV and, and you feel has to be played here. We'll talk with the panel and with both of you a bit later on more about how to make that happen. But Yodi, I think you wanted to jump quickly back in before I introduce our video and then our panel, please. Yes, really quickly. I want to. I just want to respond to something that Michael said about the HIV AIDS response being a huge success. But I would say for whom? I mean, it was a huge success for the high income countries. People in Africa continue to die in their millions years after it became. Uh, it became a, 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 a sort of a, just a chronic illness. Well, not just, but a chronic illness in the high income countries of the world. This is why we need a pandemic response because we didn't learn those lessons. So I have also, I'm on record as saying that had um, COVID started in Africa, had it started in low income countries of the world, the world would have shut us away, locked the door and thrown away the key. Because, and but if our voices are at the table, if we are part of something like this accord, I, I also don't, I mean, I agree with Michael on in many parts. Yes, one has to be given the way things have gone so far. I have said repeatedly, the global health system is broken. The global health infrastructure is broken. And given that we need to find a way to fix it. So I think this is now a time to come together. This is a time we have we have said that it's not going well. We have said it's not doing properly, but we now need to pull back and also now come together and, and work hand in hand in solidarity because we cannot continually be at odds with yeah, one absolutely. another, civil society, etc. Let's so it's come time back to, come to that together. in a moment. Over. Michael, very briefly, if you would, because I want to, we're talking about voices at the table, want to hear from our young people in the video sure. we want to show you, and then I want to bring Lazarus and the others into our discussion. Michael. Very briefly. I wholeheartedly agree. It was a failure until uh, the 2000s. Okay, so to, to clarify that, and that's when things really got going in terms of the developing world. Um, but the, um, the second thing is, when I wrote that paper about Global Public Health Convention in 2014, it was in direct response to Ebola and to the death of the only virologist in Sierra Leone um, who worked for AHF and uh, could not get evacuated and, and therefore, uh, died. But also, the situation in Sierra Leone was turned around by civil society finally being engaged. Mm -hmm. And in COVID, it has not been engaged to any significant degree. Absolutely. So I want to talk about how we make sure, as I say, that it is engaged in the process of developing the agreement and in future governance. But before we do that, um, we talked about the importance of those voices at the table. And one of those voices that is so important is the voices of young people. I'll show again uh, after when I introduce the panel, the results of, of your polling on how optimistic you are. But we asked some people from the Young Forum Gastine Network, which is a roster of young professionals engaged in fields relating to public and global health. And we asked them, what is your biggest hope for future 
and international agreements on pandemic preparedness. Let's hear what they had to say. What I hope for governments and decision makers is for them to put politics behind and our health first, and for their decisions to be more fair, transparent and inclusive, because more than ever, we know that no one is safe until everyone is safe. Thank you. My biggest hope for future international agreements on pandemic preparedness include solidarity, inclusion and trust. It's not about a blame game and no one knows everything before it even happens. So we have to trust the government and science so that we can get out of future pandemics. It is my hope that the international agreement comes to a sustainable solution that will enable us to be better prepared for the next pandemic. We can be creating an emergency framework where we can mobilize resources from those with the many to those with the few at a reasonable cost because at the end of the day, our destinies are interconnected. My biggest hope for 2022 is that leaders who will start negotiating the new pandemic treaty will give a seat at the table to communities who are often left behind, like migrant workers or unpaid carers. I hope that this new treaty will take a human-centered and social determinant of health approach, because only that would allow for future crisis management to be truly cross-sectoral, acceptable and fair. When we think about a legally binding global pandemic treaty, I think uh, most important is that we bring um, stakeholders from the global south to the table so that we can really understand what's important when we tackle um, pandemic preparedness and also vaccine inequity um, on a global scale. It must be ensured that everyone, everywhere, gets access to essential medical products, such as the vaccines. Sharing the know-how and the patents of these is vital, so low- and middle-income countries can produce things themselves, making them less dependent on high-income countries. My biggest hope for future international agreements on pandemic preparedness is that they lead to shared accountability and mutual responsibility, rather than widening the divide between the global community and hindering our ability to prevent and manage future pandemics. I think any future agreements should be built on a new social model. This pandemic has accelerated decades of innovations across many sectors that influence health. Our priority now should be to ensure these address people's needs in an inclusive manner. We must agree that we have to redefine what we understand uh, by health and what is our responsibility towards health. Moving forward, we have to recognize the role of new players uh, that can shape what we call the new normal and also rethink certain areas that have been neglected so far, such as public health. For the future concerning pandemics, I'd like to see greater collaboration, greater investment provided for surveillance, detection of diseases, and of course, emerging infectious diseases. I'd like to see greater collaboration between public and private sector enterprises. And the key players around the world should have a stake to play in providing global health security. So there we have it, solidarity, sustainability, access, uh, equity, fairness, accountability, all those words resonating uh, through that discussion. Lots to discuss uh, now with our panel. Uh, delighted to welcome Wazza Solegas MEP, uh, who is himself a trained doctor and a former Minister for Health and a leading campaigner for a stronger European Union in health. Great to have you with us, Wazza. Thank you for joining us. We also have with us Stephanie Sedou, who is French Ambassador for Global Health in the French Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs. Uh, just a reminder before we get underway as well, if we could, that please do, if you want to take the floor, click on the raised hands button and I will ask you to activate your camera mic. You don't just need to ask a question, you can also make a comment. The only thing I ask is that you're brief so I can squeeze many of you in. We already have one question in the Q&A box, which I'll put to Yodi a bit later on. Any more, again, if you prefer to write your question, please do, or your comment. I will read them out, I promise you. Um, so, Wazas, thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, it was the EU that, that began this call for a new international agreement, and it has been taking some steps to address health inequalities, but we heard 
you're already talking about vaccine equity and some of these issues that are not being adequately addressed. What for you do you believe is holding things up? And, and how much difference could the new international agreement play? I, I, maybe just before you answer that, perhaps we could have a look again at the answers the audience gave when I asked them whether they were optimistic about the prospects for this accord. And we had, ah, it's changed a little bit. We have slightly more people are optimistic, 33% than are not, 29%, but nearly 40% of our audience unsure. Thank you very much for that on the poll. Well, as I said, I don't know how optimistic you feel, how you answered that question. Um, what do you think is, is holding us up and, and, and how important could this moment be? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and, and uh, organizing this event. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that indeed that we achieve a lot of uh, good things and uh, progress in the healthcare sector, but it's not enough for all of us. Uh, we're feeling that pandemic shows that uh, alone we are very difficult to solve these problems and we need to have the more stronger team more to, should be more united not enough only in the european union but must uh, wider uh, and and this uh, 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 agreement to, to start to discuss about new new agreement uh, for uh, preparedness for pandemics i think it's very important but uh, i i Realistically, I know how it's difficult to achieve uh, between the different countries to have different approaches and particularly the different uh, authoritarian regimes in, in different regions. It's quite difficult to, to reach that agreement, but I think we should go and show the example. We're discussing here in the European Parliament about our, our stronger relations with Africa, with our Eastern Partnership countries to prepare for the uh, maybe possible upcoming uh, uh, pandemics in the future. How we can create a jo uh, joint uh, strategy for vaccination, for indicators, how we can uh, involve more, not only authorities and professionals, but also the civil society and our patient organization, because the, without uh, them, it will be very difficult to, to reach the, the agreement and uh, Common, uh, common understanding, but is going for. We are not satisfied in the European Parliament, but we are not so much involved in the negotiation. But I hope we will have the, some channels through the consultation with the European Commission, the External Action Service, and Council. They will report us in, in the, our public say, uh, European Parliament session, and we can influence the, the, the situation and negotiation. Thank you very much. Lots to come back to. And on your point about the involvement of civil society, one comment that's already come in from Catherine Pettus says, civil society is allowed one minute to make statements on the floor of the WHO executive board meeting going on right now. We usually put at the end of the day when no one is listening. So we've written a letter to the board and member states protesting at this situation. So uh, already a big issue in, in ordinary meetings. How do we fix this? We'll come back to this uh, in the context of the negotiations. But Stephanie said you're very happy to have you with us. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, you're the French ambassador for global health. And France is, of course, one of the regional co-chairs leading the negotiations. Just by way of context, can you tell us a little bit more about where we are so what's happened so far what are the timelines uh, i know they're pretty tight the deadlines for all of this and and do you have a sense of what the main elements of the accord are likely to be already or is it too early to say thank you so much for inviting me and um so excited to be at this uh, at this amazing table a great choice of theme as well and it's uh, absolutely crucial to have the voice of uh, young people and civil society also on the event. So thank you so much. So just to, to uh, give an outline of where we stand on this project of a, an accord, um, treaty binding instrument. Um, as you know, there was an extraordinary meeting of the WHO, an extraordinary World Health Assembly, which was held in November 2021, and which um, very luckily, uh, in, from the point of view of France at least, but uh, with a certain degree of consensus arrived at the decision that indeed work ought to be going forward to, towards designing um, an, an agreement. So an instrument on pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. So what the decision which was um, taken in November foresees is a 
a succession of step of successive steps. So the one which is now taking place, January 2020, is the establishment of a bureau where one representative from each WHO region will sit and uh, which will constitute an internet intergovernmental negotiating body, INB. So this INB is really where things will happen in the months to come. This is ongoing, uh, although um, some representatives have already been um, distinguished and they still need to be confirmed in, in the next weeks. Um, then from March till June of this year, 2022, there'll be public consultations, fairly broad ones um, in principle, and uh, quite quickly in August, a preliminary draft will be presented by this INB. Um, in May 2023, so a year after that, there'll be a progress report presented at the uh, usual May World Health Assembly. And uh, the plan is for the uh, negotiated text to be adopted one year even after that, that is in May 2024. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at is um, a couple of years of intensive work and a, um, a landmark for adoption, which is set in May 2024. So, um, the, the, the idea is to really have a, a, an inclusive process um, as the INB is being set up and as soon as it starts its public consultations with all essential stakeholders um, included in the, uh, in the consultations, there's a general feeling that um, it is a, a condition for success of this instrument. But to be very honest, I'm sure that's something which it will sit with the INB to find the right way to do, because I do not know to what extent uh, such a uh, specific legal instrument as a, an international treaty uh, in a, such a sensitive area as health has yet been, this is all going to, to, to have to be invented for this particular treaty. Um, treaties are signed and ratified by states, and uh, the WHO is an organization whose members are states. There's a general feeling right now that indeed the stakeholders go beyond the nation state. And so, um, uh, and so this is definitely going to be a very exciting uh, way forward challenge, certainly. Okay. But the formula will have to be found in order to um, indeed um, include all these stakeholders. But you mentioned, Stephanie, already, sorry, sorry to interrupt, that the public consultation is due to be launched already in March. So we're only a couple of months away from that, uh, if not a little bit less, as we're at the end of January already. Um, if you talk about an inclusive process, how that consultation is structured is going to be a key part of that. Uh, when do we expect to get answers on what you've pointed to is going to be very sensitive? And then I'd like to give everyone a chance to react to the sensitivities and how we cope with them and get this right. But I mean, is, is the framework of how to consult on this being developed? Has it been developed? It's going to have to be done really fast and yeah. really well. Big challenge, but in some way, I guess the fact that it's going to, that the timeline is going to be so tight and the expectation so great well, let's, let's hope that that will give the right momentum for those sitting in the INB to, to move forward. And that's certainly the right time for everyone to come up with their expectations and with and making their voices heard here and now. Absolutely. Um, so that um, it's, it's well heard as the process starts moving ahead. I'd like to get a reaction from Yodi and Michael and then come back to Lazas on the Parliament's role in all of this. But uh, Yodi, I'm hearing there, I'm hearing from Stephanie, this is tricky. This is a difficult process. They recognise the need for inclusiveness, but the nature of what might emerge is going to make that complicated. And I want to come back to that with reference to how binding or not binding it is later on. But on terms of this consultation involvement of civil society, what is your reaction to, to the dilemma uh, that Stephanie outlines? Um, 
look, it was always going to be tr tricky and um, but and it was always going to be difficult. But the fact that it is tricky and it is difficult me doesn't mean that we don't go ahead. It doesn't mean that we camp in the in, 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 in that difficulty and say this is going to put it in the too hard box. I think now is the time to really under, uh, address and this 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 treaty accord. I mean, even the fact that, as Stephanie said, you know, treaty accord. Um, a binding instrument, even the fact that we're having those discussions is, 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 a, is an indication, it's an indicator in itself as to, to the difficulties we have going forward. But this, this, this is now, this instrument, whatever we call it, is a time to address an, an opportunity to address the underlying causes of inequality and inequity which have been compounded and shown up by this pandemic. It is really the, what we need to, 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 to do to go forward. You know, I mean, we, we need to look beyond COVID to a world where global injustice in health or in, in other areas. And I have to also say that this has not just been a health, health pandemic. This has been a socioeconomic crisis. It's, 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 it's been an education crisis for many. It's been a gender crisis in many places where young girls have stopped going to school. Uganda for two years, girls have not been to school at all. What do you think has happened to many of them? We've lost a generation in education in many places and many girls have lost their life's chances, their life's their, their life's plans, they've been sold into slavery. This is beyond just health. It's beyond just a technical conversation. You know, this is, I loved what one of the young people said when, you know, I think she said that our destinies are interconnected. So, you, you know, we need to get to a world where, where this sort of injustice is neither geographic nor is it gendered. And this, this treaty accord, whatever we want to call it, is one way there. Stephanie said, yes, that we haven't yet, you know, we're negotiating how to get those voices at the table. I am a living example right before you of how difficult it is to get some of those voices at the table. Because when I was appointed special envoy for the ACT Accelerator, there's there's been a little bit of, some people have been like, uh, who is she? They're usually former prime ministers. They're usually former presidents. They're usually heads of multilateral organizations. So where did you find this woman who is more, yes, I've worked at high levels of government. Yes, I've worked in multilaterals, but as they, as, as, as Dr. Tedros and others said, when I met with them last week, is that my, my, my feel is more of an activist. And there is typically no space that there's no room in these spaces at these tables for people that you, you for people you've like us. Through, Yodi, you've but I've broken, broken through. through. So yeah. what's the key to doing the same here for this agreement and these negotiations? Well, I, I, well it's not me who broke through. I mean, I, I sort of I have this thing that I say often. You know, I've spoken at conferences about you know you get your you get you pull up a chair. If they won't let you pull up a chair, you climb on the table and you make your voice heard. I've been so passionate about the inequity and the injustice of this pandemic because it is. I mean. I almost died. My husband almost died. People of my household died because there were no vaccines. So, I mean, I've been passionate about it and I've, I've spoken forward about it very strongly, but I have, I, I've had the courage of my own conviction. Yeah. What has been courageous has been, you know, people, I guess, Dr. Tedros and whoever who made that decision to, 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 to take whatever flack and to invite me to come to that table um, and, and, and have that voice heard. But it was, it was the voices, I think, of the world really yeah. coming together. And I think that's what we're going to have to do here. We have to, we, we, you know, you can't wait to bring civil society who have lived experience to the table because it is only them who can, are going to tell us how to change this. And I, I disagree with the term civil society, just my final point. I think also we have, we've created a them and us situation by saying, oh, civil society have one minute here. I, and I think maybe we need to start thinking more about how how we, we we shift that language because we've we've almost created a divide you know oops civil society they're troublemakers <laughs> you know activists let's be careful what we, where we allow them to speak I, I straddle those lines and i don't i don't see i don't see 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 that we should allow that to to, to stop us mm, thank you very much stephanie you wanted to come back and then michael i'll come to you and do as us it's it's incredibly um strong and exciting what you're saying um I want to call you Dr. Alakija. <laughs> I like she to asked me to call her Yodi, which is why title, I'm doing so. Yodi. <laughs> she prefers yes, Yodi. Yes, <laughs> but you're, you, you, deserve, you deserve the doctor as well. But you know, uh, Yodi, Dr. Alakija, then. No, just one word to say. I think it's extremely important what you've just said. And we have to cross those lines. And it's also mm -hmm. important when governments are, tr well, try to be activists as well. And yeah. uh, I want to say to what that, well, at least France is definitely 
a government. It's, uh, and you know, we speak from the position where we're at, I'm not saying the opposite. We do defend as much as we can attention to community-led responses. And we try to be as much as we can advocates for the grassroots level, the diversity of what happens in country, a, a, a response which isn't top down and which is as much as possible grounded in the field in many languages, in, <laughs> in the many languages of the world, not only the English of Geneva or the Northern capitals. Um, and so um, I, I, I think it's extremely interesting what you said that we have to straddle the lines and it's for what it's worth. I, 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 I do find that every time as an official that I feel that I am somehow verging toward the activist. Well, maybe it's wrong. <laughs> That's what my employers expect of me, but maybe it's right. Thank you. <laughs> Michael, um, listening to this discussion and you underlined right at the beginning, you said uh, the success uh, in HIV came through and because of civil society. So listening to the discussion and some of the sensitivities that Stephanie's pointing to and why this is a difficult issue, uh, even though you've all underlined how important it is to get that lived experience at the table. What is your reaction? What is the solution here uh, to making sure that voice is heard, uh, even given the constraints Stephanie is, is talking about? What for you is the key? Same question to you, as I'll, just be, I'll be very honest. I mean, when I heard Stephanie laying out this process, I, I fell into a pit of despair. Because this is more bureaucracy. Um, and, you know, everyone nods to civil society and nobody actually winds up including it. I mean, the only institution that I know of in the health arena that includes civil society is the Global Fund. And, um, you know, if we build the building on a foundation of the current architecture, it will fall. I mean, the WHO, when we talk about the epic fail, the WHO is a major part of that, okay? whether it was the investigation of the origin, whether it's been guidance given, um, whether it's been COVAX. And, you know, I have to say also that, um, you know, as the activist here, I mean, France's position on patents and on intellectual property has been a major part along with Germany of denying access to the poor countries of vaccine, okay? And, and now we're, um, you know, now 15 months into vaccines being available, and you still have countries where a very small percentage of the population. And the issue here is not even um, just uh, patents, but in the case of biologics, you need a sharing of the actual uh, recipes and, and such, and, and we still don't have that. So I can't, and, and three years ago, I went to meet in Geneva with the head of, uh, Health for the European uh, Union, and and I was making this appeal for global public health convention, and what I got back was fortress Europe, and I think that's largely the response. And another thing I despair about is we need to. It should, global health should not be centralized in Geneva; it should be in the places that are most challenged by global health. It should be in Africa, it should be in Southeast Asia, it should be in the poor countries of Latin America and the Caribbean. And, and where you sit and, and how you fly does prejudice you as, as to your viewpoint on the world. Thank you very much. Oh, as I was listening to this discussion and you talked about the role of the European Parliament, you said you're not satisfied at the moment with the voice that you have in this process. Uh, and I'm wondering here, as you listen to this discussion, what you think is the key, um, whether uh, you as a parliament can not only stand up for your own voice in this, but also for the voice of civil society. Do you see a role there uh, and, and indeed for parliaments internationally to get involved? Uh, yeah, indeed, there are two, two maybe uh, points. First of all, the, the healthcare is not uh, uh, on the, the responsibility of European Union so much. Uh, the healthcare is more uh, on the uh, member states' responsibility. And this is one of the very important questions. Now what we have, we have the conference on the future of Europe. 
I think this is very, quite good way for our civil society to participate and to express their vision of the, of the future of Europe. And now we're discussing more widely, globally. And uh, in the parliament, we have the different uh, formats, not, being, uh, not having the, the, the committee of health, but we have different intergroups we participate in, in, uh, in different formats uh, discussing health issue and rising this question. I think it's very important that uh, not only start from the, from the top, but from the ground that uh, civil society organizations discuss this issue in the, uh, they member in the they countries and try to rise and, and push the, the, the elected uh, people in the national parliaments, in the European parliament to talk or, or to influence the, this more common approach and more, more common uh, uh, our efforts to, to solve these problems. Thank you very much. I'm going to come to audience questions that are coming in now. And if you do want to join the debate orally, please do click on the raised hands button and I'll come to you. But Stephanie, can I just ask you a question uh, related to timing? Um, and it's really a question to all of you, but starting with Stephanie, because you, Yodi said earlier, we need an accord and we need it now. Uh, I'm quoting directly, but there are members of civil society who are concerned at the speed with which this is being done. You outlined that incredibly ambitious agenda. You said a first draft already this August and the first meeting of the international negotiating body, as I understand, is not until March. So that's three, four months. There are people who say, no, we need a much more thorough analysis of this problem, of what's gone wrong uh, in the past uh, and why the hurry? Let's get this right not at speed. What do you say to them? And same question really to you all. Is it speed that matters or is it taking your time because otherwise there's a risk we won't answer the real problems? Stephanie first. Thank you so much. Well, I mean, the, the answer doesn't sit with me. Um, I'm just wondering what your, what your feeling but, is about. Uh, as, as France and part of the, uh, and, and a member of uh, um, the, the group which is establishing this, uh, this INB with others, definitely wanting to keep a momentum going, that's, that's for sure. Um, and um, I guess people will want to, to, to uh, ensure that there's a staged approach. First draft might only be draft on method or the main, uh, the main chapters. And then indeed, there's another six months until May 2023 to, to examine the, uh, uh, the preliminary uh, draft sorry, the, the progress report, and then uh, finally the adoption a year after that. So, well, I don't think that two and a half years is uh, a short time, but I guess the, the whole idea, the whole finesse will be to, um, to keep moving and to have a next stage coming while ensuring, of course, that there's enough, um, that there's enough consultation and that if needed, then, well, people can stop and say, no, this is, there, there are too many uh, issues which need to be, to be getting into. And I'm, I'm going to stop here, but you asked me earlier, what would be the, um, uh, what, what, what would be the themes? Um, indeed, there's a, a definite um, a focus on um, pandemic preparedness and, uh, and response, um, pathogen sharing, and One Health and a very strong focus on equity. The, the treaty is going to be about equity. So the treaty is going to be about principles. And um, I can't see how moving along, um, if, there is, if there is a sense that there's time needed to go deeper into all these areas in order to ensure that there's the quality is there, I can't see how we're going to sort of privilege speed and, and precipitation over quality. Indeed. And when I say we, Michael, it's uh, I mean, in charge. A, a point Stephanie's making there about uh, we need to keep it moving, we need to keep the momentum, but she did raise and mention that question of is there enough time to do the consultation? For you, what is more important? Getting the process, and that includes this involvement, giving all of you the seat at the table uh, that you've underlined is so important. What is more important? Keeping that momentum so we make progress and we deliver an agreement that can make a difference, uh, or waiting to make sure we maximize the difference it makes. I mean, that may be a false choice, but what's your view on this speed issue? You have to be as fast as COVID. I mean, uh, 
that's the bottom line. I mean, I don't know why um, Security Council has never met, Security Council of the UN has never met to discuss this challenge. You know, I don't know why, you know, um, <clears throat> um, there isn't basically a constant, a meeting that's constant going on, you know, uh, rotating members of different countries. Um, I mean, I don't see why we can't utilize the frameworks we have for WTO for and for um, air traffic control for atomic energy uh, to hammer something out in the next six months. I mean, <clears throat> where will we be if you look at the last two years, if this continues for another two years, the way it's been, I mean, Global public health has lacked urgency and it still does and it does in relationship to COVID and it does in relationship to this treaty. I don't think we can wait two more years uh, or three more years. Plus by virtue of being a treaty, it's going to, in that adoption, that will no doubt take years. Mm -hmm. right? um, so I don't think the process that we're discussing now, while it's a step in the right direction to be for the uh, nations of the world to say we need uh, a framework, um, I, that's part of why I'm not optimistic. I mean, going at this pace, you know, how many more millions of people are going to die? How many more millions of people are going to be infected? How much more damage socially and economically is going to happen before we start cooperating? I, I don't think it can wait. Yeah, just a comment um, here. I'll come to you, Yodi, and I know Stephanie, you want to come in and then who has us, but Rafael de Andres Medina uh, on this time issue says, time also needed to come into enforcement. Matter subjected to enforcement and funding, the threshold for treaty validity, all of these things will be critical issue. And Ray, he also raises the point about is variable geometry to go further for the coalition of the willing be an option. Um, so this this issue of, of timing and how far can we go in the time available. But Yodi, you wanted to come in and then just Stephanie and I seem to have lost to Azas. I hope you'll come back in a moment. Yodi. Well, I mean, a couple of things, just to react to a couple of things. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with what, what Michael says when he says, this, um, and when he talks about urgency and speed, he also talked about the fact that we haven't, as a global community, and I have called for this several times, including, you know, literally, literally from my study in, 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 in Abuja, you know, speaking to people at the UN security, who are on the Security Council to say, why is this issue not being raised? So I couldn't agree more um, with all of that. However, we, 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 there's, there is the urgency, that there is the tightrope between urge, with, between the urgency and getting it right. There's a tightrope that I, I, I hear, the, the, the tension I hear in, in what, you know, Stephanie was saying about, you know, the inclusion, pulling all the, vo the voices and everybody in, as well as making sure this is actually done but th this speaks to the underlying problem and I think Michael again mentioned it when he talked about WTO etc that to address the inequity the inequality inherent in these global systems we need to rebalance these power structures that underpin them and it does require a bottom-up approach and it's grounded in the lived experience in the voices and the ideas of people who are most affected you know be, be, be they in the global north or the global south which is the case right now but you know, I, I also want to take us to, 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 into history because those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. You know, after the Second World War, the whole world was upended, right? I mean, and the world came together to shift and change systems. This is a one in a hundred year event that is upending the entire world. And I think what we're failing to see as a global community is the urgency of that moment and the seriousness of that moment. I think it is changing governments, it is changing systems, not just the, the, the inequity, but the sense of injustice is, is, is raising almost revolutions in different countries. So that speaks to the urgency, but it also speaks to what Stephanie is talking about and what the French government, you know, and I think it's really important, their role right now is as, as, as EU, in EU lead, pulling others along in the geopolitics of this, which is critical. The geopolitics says that, you know, we have to speak to, in, in many ways, we have spoken too much to our differences in the last year and a half due to geopolitics. But the urgency of this moment also calls us to talk back, run back, go back to history yep. and look at just, sure, just, sorry, lots yeah, of questions to address just what need. the world, just what the world needs in this moment. And how do we do it just like we did in post, post World War II? We are in a moment like that. And I think that is the sort of that's the sort of tempo that we need to keep. Over. Thank you Sorry. very much, um, Stephanie. 
you wanted to come in brief one if you would lots to come back to and as I said if you could put your camera back on uh because I'd love to come to you and then I'll come uh to Milka Sokolovic uh from EPA in our audience and I want to read out we're getting lots of written questions coming in too Stephanie yeah, no, I so I so want to pick up on what Ayode just said, but uh, no, I simply wanted to go back one step and say that well, the world gave itself a, uh, a rules of the road, as it were, in case of pandemics, which is the international health regulations, which came were um, established in two thousand fifteen, right after the first, well, the latest, the last scare that we'd had with the uh, uh, with the the, the previous pandemic, um, the previous SARS pandemic. Of course, what we've seen this time around is that including this IHR wasn't sufficient, needs to be improved, and there's work that is being done in that, um, in that respect. So in particular, to give uh, more operational powers to the WHO to go and make inquiries in, in country, to have um, um, more flexible um, stages of an epidemic to, to, to declare, to for member states also to report uh, more accurately and be able to share more data when um, health events are, are happening, etc. So this is this work is being done. So we're not without any solution as it is. We could have left it there. There could have been. I mean, the whole effort could have been to, and as it will have to be done to improve this um, international health regulations, but the decision. The, the idea came up, it was a European idea at the beginning, and it's now gained momentum to actually top that with something broader, wider, more ambitious in the form of a treaty on accord um, with principles uh, that the international community and all its diversity uh, and its solidarity and compre comprehensiveness wishes to give itself in terms of an ambition and a commitment to um, tackle uh, health globally okay. in a more effect effective Thank way. Thank you. We seem to have lost Oasis for a moment. So let me come to Milka Sokolovic uh, first to raise a question from the floor. And then I have a couple of questions. You keep using the word treaty and I have a question about whether that is what will emerge. And if not, what do we need? Uh, but Milka, please. And then I'll come back to Oasis. Milka Sokolovic. Oh. Yes, thank you very much also for pronouncing that complicated last name. Um, <laughs> Indeed, Milka Sokolovic from the European Public Health Alliance. Uh, what shall I say? An incredibly insightful discussion. Thank you so much for it. And also thanks Ilona for sharing those links in, uh, to the briefings. Um, my question goes potentially to Ayodi, but potentially also for Stephanie or other panelists. So what clearly comes from this discussion is that trust will be the key condition to success for this treaty, but not only for it. And we are talking about trust in governments or between governments, trust between sectors and stakeholders, between global north and global south. But at the same time, we see a massive decrease in trust among ordinary people. There are trust yeah. in governments, trust in science, you name it. We live at a moment where we have limitless uh, access to potentially helpful information, but also to inaccurate, contradicting information yes. in which science gets misrepresented. And that causes confusion and fear, leading to a decrease in trust that has already demonstrated a detrimental impact on public health, even where access to vaccines uh, is not an issue. So how do you see us going around this massive challenge? Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Yodi, I think it was most mainly directed to you, but please, brief one if you wouldn't, then I want to come <laughs> wow. to you guys. Thank you very much, Melka. Um, that, that's quite the challenge. I think if we can fix that one, we will be able to fix the world. Um, that question, uh, but but to, from from where I sit, let me let me speak to 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 where I think tr trust has been fractured. I mean, you raise a very good point about individual levels of trust. We're talking about trust broken it, between us as individuals, and I would say almost from the early days of the pandemic, where you would literally cross the road to get away from another person. That has been you know a natural human reaction to this. Oh my goodness, are they going to? infect me um, to the more sort of global in collective. And so we're speaking about trust on different levels. Institutional trust is broken. Global trust between within nations is broken and trust tr trust in systems is broken and trust in, 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 the, in the wider 
what we would call the common good agenda literally is broken and that is broken th that for me is the most is the most difficult to answer you know that is broken because yes natural human instinct is to protect oneself and to protect one's one's family but when the world and the world's leaders seem to forget that it was even in their own self-interest, in their enlightened self-interest to vaccinate the world, to, to, you know, if I come to the Omicron moment, as I, as I refer to it regularly, you know, it was when Omicron arrived that we suddenly realized that, oh, holding vaccines to ourselves and not helping the rest of the world is actually going to come back and bite us in the back. And, 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 and that is the trust for me that is going to be the most difficult to repair because that shows that as a global community, that, that those who are from, from, from outside, I, I often, you know, I, you know, sort of Michael's called himself an activist. It's really weird for me, the activist. It's weird for me to be on a panel where I'm not seen as the rebel in the room and the activist, yeah. you know, but I I've often said to, I've also often said to people, really that you know activism is not about it's not about me it's about those around me okay. it is about understanding that we as a global community need to become activists for all us us or all of us to be safe the global health security system it, it has been so fractured in this moment okay, Yodi, I, want to, I, I want i want to bring you, you as, yeah i want to bring you as i said on this question yeah. of trust because yeah. as politicians uh it is it is part of your, your job and then to too. instill trust in people to communicate those messages mm -hmm. what do you think who as us the key is in whatever agreement emerges from this to making sure that it contributes to rebuilding that trust to addressing these issues how important will that be and how can it help oh it's very difficult <laughs> very difficult question because you know when we live in so open society, when the social network is going and everyone can say what he wants yeah. to say and the information flow is so huge that it's very difficult to keep the authorities of research, of scientists, of some politicians uh, who try to, to build some kind of agreement and, and progress. And, and this is uh, really very, very, very important to uh, follow what you say and what you do and how you can uh, show for the you 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 citizens that they can more and more try to to trust for for our steps and and, and reality is such that we should uh, uh, adopt the, the, the law and, and we should uh, reach the agreement and implement it starting from very small for more step, more step for example yeah. the vaccination if we uh, guarantee the, the accessibility for everyone in the, in the, the world, European Union, Africa, Asia, and uh, yeah. everywhere, this would be the, the very good step show to, to, to the starting to build this uh, trust uh, in, in uh, the future. Thank you. So show by doing, not just by saying, Michael, you want exactly. us to come in. And there's lots of questions from the audience. We're going to do a quick fire round. But Michael. I mean, being the rebel in the room is the only rational response to what's happened in the last two years. And that's what's disturbing about this conversation. It's still talking about the same framework all over again. And the fact that no one is responding to what I'm saying about that tells you, I think, how it is, but beyond that is actions speak louder than words. Why should yeah. the global community trust any power center on this epidemic? Is there any place in the world that has had a great response to this in terms of on what should be done for the world, not just for their own country? No, I mean, and also from our experience in the 13 countries that we operate in Africa, a lot of the hesitancy around the vaccine was fed exactly. by the lack of access. In, in the US, what happened in the rich countries was happened is that the people who were skeptical, many of them were converted by seeing their family members and friends and coworkers getting the vaccine and seeing that they were fine. Yeah. So, uh, and the reality is that the vaccine access question has not been resolved. I mean, there's, there's places in the world where it's still very difficult to get the vaccine. 
Thank you very much. Um, Stephanie, a question to you, and I really wanted to come to this with all of you. Uh, and this is from Ashley Furlong uh, Politico saying, and, and you talked about a treaty, Stephanie, but she asks, up until now, a lot of the discussion has been on whether a treaty is needed and not what it would contain. So there is this question of, of what the treaty should, should have in it. But I just want to come back on the question of, of treaty. Uh, because there's been some discussion and some concern in civil society about the degree to whatever happened, whatever comes out of this process will be binding. And you talked about some of the sensitivities uh, that need to be addressed in negotiating an international agreement. There are those who say the more binding you make it, uh, the less buy-in you'll get, the harder it will be to get everybody on board and everybody signed up. There are others who say if you don't make it binding, it won't have any impact. Before we come to the, the content, on that question of, of the legal form and, and how tough it is, um, where does the balance lie in it being an effective uh, instrument, uh, but also bringing everybody on board? And I, I come to you first because you made that point about sensitivities earlier. Well, I'm not, I, you've said it all, Ducky, really. I mean, this is going to be the whole point of the, of the treaty is if this is going to bring an added level of, of significance to, to, to collective action, then it's going to be a game of everyone uh, agreeing to bring more to the table um, than they would have thought initially in order to take to take again. And I want to go back to what's been saying just before about you know how um, the response for the past two years has been completely um, catastrophic and I don't think there's anyone who will, would say that this has been has been kind of all right and could have been worse. Etc. No, I mean collectively we've all failed, and that's that's definitely uh, there's no running away from that. Um, there's a, and the questions are, are are posed. We have questions about the system that is the one that we had going forward, which is basically the access system, one based on the market. The question of the market is posed. I'm, it is clearly posed. Health, can health, to what extent can health be left to market mechanisms? Mm -hmm. That's the whole discussion at the WTO. Watch the space, watch the space. The question is being set at political level in all those sort of various multilateral um, instances where various aspects and sides of the issue are being tackled, WTO for trade, WHO for health, Security Council is political and it has, a, as it says, security, a security side to it. Is that where we want health issues to be, all of them this tackled? Um, there has to be a balance, but um, so um, I think that is the question that the treaty would probably is public it's going to be at the heart of this whole negotiation if not the market which is what we had with whatever mechanisms we we had until now for this covid and which failed then what and we could have to come up with some some good good idea and uh and indeed the question that you you're asking Jackie that's the other one is to what extent mm -hmm. do stakeholders mostly states We'll see to what extent there can be room um, made for, for others and what with mm -hmm. what kind of accountability and what kind of responsibility. But who is able to commit and what does this commitment imply in order to, to get, well, to, to, to have the right balance between what you give in terms of transparency and commitment to the, to the collective and what you take out of it in terms of ensuring your own security and, and, you. and access to, to your people. Thank you. Michael, you wanted to come in Products. here. I just wanted, I wanted to ask Stephanie, why is France opposed uh, lifting the intellectual property limitations? Why are they opposed? I like, you know, if I could to get a direct answer. I mean, the United States has said to uh, abandon the patents and France and Germany have supported uh, maintaining them. Why? Can I just add to that? Um, because Sarah Mundir, hang on a minute, Sarah Mundir from Novartis has a, sim a question along those lines, uh, just saying a quick question to you all. Do you think if we move towards an IP waiver, will it reduce the speed of developments of vaccines and treatments for future health threats coming from the industry? Others also asking similar questions about IP rights. 
Um, no, France has, hasn't opposed uh, a, a, an American proposal to lift the waiver. I'm, that's not the information I have. Uh, France and Germany um, have a, uh, there's a European position that is defended by the commission as part of the, of the um, um, uh, competency of the commission and which is for now to remain on the state of quo, but there's a lot going on. There are lots of discussions going on and um, it's a very active conversation. Our president, Emmanuel Macron, in May said that he was, that um, patents should not stand in the way and should not be an obstacle to access. Um, France has a consistent um, involvement and investment in all um, possibilities that are given by the current um, um, uh, EPIC uh, agreements, uh, TRIPS agreement, sorry, for, um, uh, technology transfers, uh, transfers. We've invested in Unitaid in the medicine patent pool from the beginning, that i.e. mid of the mid 2000s. I know that's not the same as the waiver, but still we have a track record of being one of them only and main donors certainly of these organizations who have developed over the past 12 years, a real engineering capacity in, in forging these negotiated agreements. And that was for indeed the access to ARVs and all the um, three pandemics, um, um, medicines and, and, and products, uh, also malaria that you very rightly um, mentioned earlier and tuberculosis. And that's what indeed enabled Unitate to jump into the Okay. Uh, the the, um, Sorry, we, the need, we need to response. move on. There's still lots more questions to yeah. address. So no, just uh, an attempt yeah. at uh, yeah, Yodi, Yodi, just on this question of treaty not by, by how binding it should be, what incentives for compliance, how do we make sure that this agreement, whatever form it takes, really does hold the world to account and addresses the failings, the fault lines that you've talked about? And, and do you, with those who say we need to get everybody on board, so we maybe shouldn't be quite, we shouldn't be so ambitious uh, that we lose uh, a lot of people and can't get this agreed. Where do you stand on that? Briefly, if you would, really brief replies now, because there are lots more questions from the audience to come to. Well, it's very, it's very difficult to be brief because this is such a deep, know, deep, deep issue. <laughs> um, but but in, in a couple of words, um, Accountability is what you're speaking to, and very few people like to be held accountable, and governments even even less so. I mean, it speaks more to the, the further to the, the the issue around the issues around trust. I think I've I think I've spoken to this already. I think we need to get something done. I hear very much Michael's frustration as to why we're we even having this conversation. But what is the alternative? You know, we can't just leave things as they are. So we have to somehow. It is it, it is only by having these conversations that we'll be able to get to what the it might not be the ideal scenario, but at least it'll be, it might not be perfect, but at least it, it, it will go some way towards sol solving the solution. So I mean, to, towards a solution. So, you know, getting every, are we going to take all the time in the world to have every single country agree to have everybody around the table? We don't have that time. Again, you know, Michael has spoken to that urgency, but we have to do something. And I think that the, the, the proposal I have spoken already about you know how the whole world order shifted um 70 odd years ago that is what we need to be looking at i i find it interesting what um stephanie just said you know when she said watch the space with wto and and who for health and and you know is it security council that we really want to be going to for this this is a globe it's not a health issue and i think that is what we're falling the trap we're falling into this is a global it, it, it's a security issue of peace and security to my mind around the world and we're beginning to see that in pockets with coups in west africa etc cetera, etc cetera, and uprisings in various parts of the world so i really do think we need to think outside of the box is is it a treaty? Is it a is it a um, is it a accord? We need to think outside the box, but we need to think collectively. And we also, I have to say, need to stop being at loggerheads with each other. We have to recognize that we all must come together to find a solution. Because when COVID was killing people, it was killing you, whether you were whether you were government, whether you were low income or high income, whether you were CSO, NGO farmer or not it was killing everybody somebody asked the question very last point in the chat that would you bring you know anti-vaxxers into the conversation yeah. <laughs> look you are all people i would bring everybody 
into the conversation. We all have to be at the table. There is no exclusion in this. Inclusion has to be the key and urgency. Thank you. Michael, uh, let me come to you very briefly on that one. There's two comments in the chat. Now, I want to come back to your lack of optimism, Michael, uh, because the World Duchenne Organization, don't have a name, shares your cynicism, if you like, about the process, saying a call for radical innovation in the field of health governments has become painfully clear every time the world suffered from a severe pandemic, HIV, AIDS, H1N1, swine flu, Ebola, and now COVID. This person says, what makes you think that this time it will work? You don't at the moment, but someone else says, what do you believe is essential to achieve a different outcome this time as compared with adherence to international health regulations so far? What, Michael, will turn your pessimism, if I can put it that way, into greater optimism? How can we make sure it is different this time? Well, let me say, first of all, that I don't believe that the perfect should be the enemy of the good, and that's not what my position. My position is, first of all, is let's do what we can do today, which is to make vaccines available to everyone in the world. Okay, and bust up a monopoly, the European and American drug companies access. In the US, those companies were heavily subsidized by the public uh, coffers, okay? And, and so that's, that's just, when we look back on this 100 years from now, that monopoly and the government support of those monopolies will be considered a crime, a, a war crime, okay? But more importantly, so that's, we should do what we can, what we can do now. And, and I think that we should immediately empower the Global Fund, which has been, in my opinion, a big success with a portion of this responsibility. Mm-hmm. I also believe that the, um, we, we have to at least establish the principles that every government um, must declare an outbreak or be penalized economically. Okay? I think, second of all, we need to store uh, PPEs and other things that we know will be needed now and in the future strategically so we're not scrambling to get it there, right? Um, and, and then we need to invest immediately in reinforcing the public health system for whatever threats we have. While we're doing that, we should discuss, have a more fundamental analysis of what failed, okay? have the best minds come together to say, what, why did the WHO participate with China in concealing you know, the facts about the situation and what type of reform of the WHO needs to be done? Mm-hmm. And these are the kinds of things that I believe need to be done. Thank you. And that picking up very point on that question earlier from the audience about the provisions of the treaty, the sort of things we need to address. Lazas, for you, this debate we're having about perfection uh, potentially being the enemy of the good, uh, that we need to move, we need to move fast uh, and therefore uh, do what we can now and, and build on that. But it, it came to the question of, so should it, whatever we do be less ambitious to bring more people, more countries on board, increase the chances of it being approved uh, by everybody? or do we say no we need more and therefore we need to take the time and we need to be more ambitious and just persuade everybody where do you stand on the level of ambition we should have i I see i think that we should stop talking and start to doing (laughs) this this is very important uh, if you're not careful alliance of global and i start from the smaller one but we should start and and, and do the first step and and creating some kind of example of success because exactly. without this, it's very difficult to, to achieve the result or to, to build the, the real team or, or majority in, in general. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask you all what that doing, what that first step should be in the doing in a moment. But Stephanie, could I just come back? Um, because Michael was talking there about the Global Fund and the role it played. Uh, and both you and France have been calling for a stronger role for the World Health Organization in managing health crisis and pandemics. What structures, what do you want strengthened? Does this need, do we need to have changes in the way decisions are making? Is it about the financing? What what for you is key here? Um, First, thank you for the question. The WHO is, um, it's three things. It's a community of member states, Um, It's uh, a um, legitimacy of scientists Mm. and it's a secretariat. 
what we feel must be uh, strengthened is indeed the secretariat in the sense that it's got to have more predictable, more reasonable budget and resource. But we also feel that what needs to be strengthened is this community of stakeholders and particularly members and well, pr primarily member states. And so um, we are interested in uh, proposals to create a sub body, possibly of the executive board um, and any mechanism. And this is being discussed right now at the, at the executive board, which is taking place right now, uh, any mechanism mechanisms which would actually uh, make member states even more proactive, more involved, and take, take on this political and uh, role, role of accountability that, uh, that they, they have within the WHO. The WHO belongs to the world, it belongs to all countries. The majority of, um, let's say, southern countries, I'm sorry for this, it's not a very uh, uh, appropriate um, term, or well, let's say lower and min middle income mm -hmm. countries and the minority of uh, others. <laughs> and, it's, and, it's, and this is where the power rests. It's a very democratic um, assembly. If you take it uh, from the UN point of view, of course, it's a UN organization and it has its limitations in some of representation. Civil society ought to be there. Um, but I if so, and the Global Fund uh, is a uh, an organization of that new, let's say, 20, 21st century type, it does also have the private sector around the table, uh, private foundations, and, uh, and, and, other, and other stakeholders. Thank so, you. Any other quick thoughts to this before we try and draw some conclusions about where we go from here? Anybody want to come in? Michael? I just don't see how a structure where, where the Secretariat has 194 bosses, where, where we have to rule by consensus and possibly uh, work. So that's one reform, I think, uh, to strengthen uh, some type of elected or executive uh, body that actually runs the organization rather than the World Health uh, Assembly. But I would like reaction from people, if I could, about do we think that the whole World Health Establishment ought to be located in Geneva, which is one of the wealthiest cities in the world, and that people ought to be flying uh, first class from, from uh, those offices in Geneva to, to the poorest places in the world? What do you think about that? How do you feel Yodi, about uh, Should we move it to Africa? <laughs> Look, I don't, I, I mean, the location of the World Health Organization really is the least of my worries right now. I agree that we need offices in global in the global south. I agree that some things need to change. But I think Michael has mentioned earlier what is the, what the more critical issues are right now is that we get, we get vaccines into people's arms. An argument around where WHO is and dismantling those structures and those buildings speaks to the ag argument about the decolonization of, 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 of health and of aid and all of that. And you know, we can have that conversation forever. But that is not today is not that day. But as part of this today, conversation, very briefly, are changes today, needed to the structures of the WHO, do you think? Sorry? I, I, are changes I, I, needed to the structures of the WHO? I think structure, the changes are needed to the structure of global health, period, not just yeah. WHO. Yeah. Global global fund, um, um, whoever, whatever it is, there are changes needed to the structure of everything. I have said that repeatedly. The mm -hmm. global health structure is broken, but it is also important that it is a democratic organization. It is also important that when you know ministers from Africa go there, they are able to speak with 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 with, 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 with the same the same time or the, the same voice as other. So it's a very complex question. But when we talk about pandemics, which is a critical issue, we have to take in the fact that that structure has not necessarily served us right. And we have to, not the WHO, but the entire global health infrastructure. I think it needs to be strengthened on, on, on many levels. And I also, I mean, I also think that, 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 that we have to, again, I'm gonna end on that. We have to stop this divide between the us and the them. And I think that is part of it. You know, so WHO is going forward in, 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 in the strengthening or whatever the process need to find a way to have permanent representation that is not an outside voice. And I think that goes for, quite frankly, for everything. Thank you very much. We are almost out of time. It's been a wonderful discussion. But each of you, I want to pick up on what Uaza said. And in a sentence, basically, each. Uaza said, we need to stop talking and start doing. Yeah. What yeah. is the first thing, the start doing? Uh, we've talked about so many issues in relation to these negotiations and the agreement. What for each of you will be the key next step, the key priority 
for this agreement to address all the issues we've been discussing and really deliver a more transparent, more inclusive, more accountable, uh, more, I don't think word, there is a word solidarity-ness, uh, but a, a <laughs> system that shows more solidarity, more coordination, coming back to the other word that's come through a lot. Oh, as I, you raised it, key for you, key next steps, one minute each. Who has us first? Yeah. The first of all, we should say that not only the structures, but very important, the political will. Yes. And the second, the first step is, it, uh, should be, for example, the common uh, or calendar for vaccination and, co and joint procurement for vaccines for maybe more broader region. For example, now I'll be working in European Parliament with our relation with Eastern Partnership country, but it may be uh, European Union and Africa. I, I think we should start do that thank you thank you stephanie for you key next step muted at the moment stephanie sorry there we go. i will take it up from where yours is took it and uh and say that indeed i i think that there's a really interesting um echelon here of uh action which is being empowered right now and that is the regional one of course the eu um, well, we're, we're not currently speaking as a presidency of the EU, so we're very aware of that. But uh, Europe is rebuilding itself around health. It's rebuilding its health competency, and it's and that's definitely the message from the Fran French presidency in the events that will happen in February. Is that while rebuilding this health competency for Europe, this has to be open. It's it's got to be rebuilt as global health as of. A phenomenon which is global and in global exactly. there's solidarity and um and the dialogue we're having with the african union uh, later in february is going to be super interesting from one sovereign region or, or one uh, region wanting to regain sovereignty on health and other issues to another thank you the very same, much indeed um, michael your key priority key next step and in the intellectual property framework we have now and vaccinate the world Thank you very much. Yodi, you have a final word. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear Stephanie speak about the, the EU Africa um, AU summit later in February. I, I will actually, I've been invited to speak at that and looking forward to seeing how those interactions go. I think the governance um, and global governance and leadership at, at, at country level and at regional level is, is another part of this that we have not had time to interrogate, but I think that is going to be a very important part of this um, going forward. Um, we need stronger international rules to address the risk of pandemics, there's no doubt about it, I think we'll all agree on that. How we do it, um, I, I agree again with you, sirs, that we need to stop arguing okay, about it, we need to just do it. I often tell people that I'm a Nike girl, I'm a just do it girl, I often, you know, just go ahead and then you write the you write you write the, the the explanations and what have you afterwards you can't do that as governments but you have to find those who are able to do that we need action more than words we need global solidarity we need inclusion and we need um we need to stop fighting one another we need to come together and recognize that this pandemic affects us all and we need to end it and stop future future threats Thank you so much. And thank you to you all uh, for a great discussion. We covered a lot of ground. As you said, Yoni, there were bits that we didn't get to. Uh, but thank you for a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Thank you for your frankness, honesty, and that coming together that Yodi talked about. Thank you to all of you for joining. Thank you for all your comments uh, and your questions. We managed to squeeze almost all of them in, not quite, but almost them. The organizers ask you, please do fill out the evaluation survey. Once you leave the webinar, let us know your thoughts about the event but it only remains for me on behalf of our audience panel uh, to thank you very much i'll do it for them because in the online world they can't for a great discussion thank you for taking the time with us for being here today thank you to all of you for listening and for joining in and have a good evening and stay safe take care